Man, a church, welcome. If you're not already standing, get to your feet. We're here to worship a God who loves us, a God who saves, a God who's worthy. So let's lift him up. We sing. You have come, we have found life everlasting. Now a lot to know your freedom never ending. You
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Come on, with all you have, we sing holy Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Worthy of every song Yes, Jesus, you alone are my rock. You alone are our salvation. We worship you. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, welcome, man of church. So good to see you all. Why don't you guys go ahead and have a seat? 
My name is James, and it's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here tonight. But I want to give a special welcome to anyone who's here for the first time. So if you're a first-time guest, we don't want to embarrass you, but we, we, we do want to get to know you a little bit better. And the way we do that is through two cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. So if you can go ahead and pull those cards out, and the first card is called our guest card. Even as I'm speaking, go ahead and fill that out, because that gives us a little bit of information about you, so we know how to serve you better in the future. In a few moments, we're going to take up an offering, and that card is the only contribution we want from you tonight. Now, the second card is our first impressions card. It gives you an opportunity to tell us how we did in welcoming you today. But more importantly, on the bottom of that card, there's a little ticket that says free gift. At the end of the service, you can take that ticket to the back of our auditorium, to the first time guest area, or out into our lobby to any one of our VIP team members. And we want to put a gift in your hand, just our way of saying thank you for being our guest here tonight. So Man of Church, let's put our hands together for any and all first time guests. Now, if you're watching online, we also want to welcome you. We want to get to know you better as well. And you can let us know how we've been blessing your life or how we can serve you better by sending us a note at contact at church. So let's give it up for our online guests as well, Mana Church. Now, Thanksgiving is, you know, it's almost here and it's one of my favorite holidays. It's the one time that I get to sit on the couch and watch football and eat all kinds of good, yummy food, the kind of food that just sticks to your ribs. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so for some people, it's mashed potatoes. I'm more of a sweet potato guy, and my mom's sweet potatoes are so sweet, my wife calls them dessert, and I say, no, if they go with the greens and they go with the turkey, that's just regular food. Dessert comes later. But you know, one of my favorite things about Thanksgiving is being at home and being with family. And even when you're not at home, you're with friends and it feels like family. So for all those in the military and for those who've been gone away from home and a different places off to college, you may go somewhere and say, you know what, this isn't my birth family, but this is family, this is home. And maybe you've been coming to Manor Church for a while and you feel like, you know what, this is home. Well, we'd like you to join the Manor family and make it official by becoming a member of Manor Church. You can do that by going out to the Join the Manor Family section in our lobby just after the service. But we want you to be a part of our family and make it official. So Manor Church, right now, we're getting ready to take up an offering. So let's put our hands together. As our host team goes comes forward and we get ready to take this offering, we want to remind all of you watching online that you can use one of the, any one of the giving options to give as well. Just click on that give button and you can be free to give as well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back a small portion of what you've given us. Lord, in this season of Thanksgiving, there's so many things to be thankful for. And we hope that this offering can bless the lives of someone close to us. May this offering be used to advance your kingdom all around the world, but especially along the military highway as we multiply for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My name is Joshua Clark. I'm originally from Capron, Virginia, and I graduated the Experience Internship in the spring of 2016. And now I'm the pastor of operations at Mana Church Colorado Springs. In the spring of 2015, I was about to graduate college and I had no idea what my next step was. But I met up with my friend and mentor, Pastor Joe Adams, and he really called out a calling that God had placed on my life that I had been ignoring, and that was to go into ministry. He told me about the Experience Internship. And so that fall, the fall of 2015, I joined the Experience. While I was an intern, I had the privilege of leading serve teams, outreaches, small groups, and so much more. Those experiences were amazing, but really what made the most of them is that I had the mentors and leaders in place to, to help me make the most of those experiences and glean as much as possible as I could from them and really equip me for ministry. While I was an intern, Mana Church initiated its multiply strategy, and it was during that time that I felt God calling me to be a part of the launch of Mana Church Colorado Springs. So several months later, just a few months before the launch, me and my wife set out on the military highway to Colorado Springs. 
On January 21st, 2018, I was a part of the launch team and we launched in a snowstorm with 420 people. We've seen God do so many amazing things throughout the short life of Mana Church. Just in the first 10 months, we've seen over 270 people give their life to Jesus. It's been amazing to be a part of this. And I'm so thankful for the experience and the mentors that I gained during that time because it equipped me for the ministry that I'm doing today. But even more important than that, it equipped me to be the husband, the father, and the friend that God has called me to be. I'm so thankful for the experience and the foundation of faith, character, and leadership that it gave me to equip me to be the man that God has called me to be. The story of Christmas, most certainly not new, has been told oh so often by many or few. A Savior was born. He would cleanse us from sin. The angels sang loudly, Jesus for the win. Who else, you may ask, was there that first Christmas night? And whom will we study to gain fresh insight? It's the who's of Christmas who play such a big part. In this series, we'll study them right from the start. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Manor Church wherever you are. If you're in one of our city sites around this region or if you're someplace around the country, Hawaii, Colorado Springs, Fort Huachuca, maybe even Afghanistan, watching on the internet, we love you. Come on, everybody. Let's make them feel welcome. And welcome to part two of our little mini-series called Evangelism Made Easy. And I really want to change the title of it to Evangelism Made So Easy because we're going to make this so easy. But I know... This is one of the most terrifying topics we could ever get into. I know the average person says, please don't make me share my faith. Please don't make me do that. Please just let me bring him to church and you do it from the pulpit. But the scripture teaches us that it's not the pulpit, right? It's the pew that makes the difference. If we're going to try and win the world one pulpit at a time, it's not going to make it. But there are a lot of people around the globe who are believers that think it's the job of the pastor to win all the people to Christ that are going to be won. But it's just not going to work that way. And I know you're smarter than that, right? But I got to still tell you, I feel like I'm the dad who's trying to coax his kid to go off the high dive for the first time. Y'all remember going off the high dive for the first time? You were scared. You said, go, go ahead and just climb the ladder. And you look up there and, and you think, it's, it's you know, the regular diving board and the other one's not that much higher until you start climbing that ladder, right? And then you get up there and you feel like it's like 800 feet high. Like, Dad, you're making me jump from a water tower. And it looks like concrete down there. But, you know, when you, first, you go ahead and jump and you find out it's really not that bad. But why is it that you always jump at Dad? You ever notice that? You ever notice that? Dad's right here in the kid goes, he's going to jump. Oh, my gosh. He's jumping. He's coming right down at me. You're going to kill me. Anyway, so I kind of feel like Dad a little bit, trying to coax you all to, you can do this. But it, because it really is so easy. And, and yet the scripture tells us that all those people out there that think it's just the pastor that's supposed to win everybody, that's not really very biblical. It says in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says to go into all the world and preach the gospel, preach the good news to all creation. That means everybody. And you think, okay, Michael, great. Well, we'll send some people over there to win those people over there. But what about the people who are here? What about the people in our family? 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll receive power. Power to do what? To be my witnesses. And what does a witness do? I mean, we use that word witness as, as, as synonymous with sharing your faith. But really, the idea behind witness is to, is to say what you know, to say what you experienced, to say what you know to be true, what you saw, what you've experienced, what is yours. So he says the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And when he does, you're going to receive power to do what? To be my witness, to share your story in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, where's Jerusalem? For us, it's right here in the Fayetteville Fort Bragg area. For you, it's wherever it is you're located. So that means we can't escape the fact that even though we may not be able to go way out there to the ends of the earth, we, we may not be able to go way out there to the Judea, Samaria, which is North Carolina and the United States, the uttermost parts of the earth or the far reaches of the earth. We may not be able to go there, but we surely can go to work every day, right? And we can go to our soccer games and stand beside some of the parents while we watch our kids out there playing, kicking themselves in the shins for $200 a month, whatever the case may be. But we can go and watch that. We, we can go to work, we can go to play, and we're responsible to follow that prompting to share our story. And so that's one of the things we learned last week is that everybody has a story. And as we broke it down, there's two things we wanted to focus on last week which I wanna catch you up on. Two things, number one, everyone has a story. But more than a story, We have stories. In fact, what we learned was we're a composite of literally hundreds of stories. I mean, has anybody here ever been rejected, ever been abused? Anybody here ever been, had their feelings hurt? Anybody here ever been divorced? Anybody here ever suffered a loss or grief? Everyone here, anybody ever got promoted? How about demoted? Anybody here been sad or depressed? Anybody been addicted? So as you think about those things, you think, yeah, well, I was this, but not that. And I was this, but not that. And I was this, but not that. The the follow-up question is, has God helped you at any time in any of those areas? And every single time he helped you in those areas, he was adding to your story, which is really a composite of stories. It's stories upon stories. And some of those areas where God helped us in the past, we're going to go through those areas again, and he's going to revisit that, and he's going to take us deeper. And so those kinds of things provide opportunities because the second thing I want you to remember from last week is this, is that there are people in our orbit whose lives are asking questions, the answer to which is found in your story. Now, not always. Somebody may be at work and you ask a person, why are you so downtrodden? They say, well, I'm going through a a terrible divorce. And maybe you've been married your whole life. You you really can't afford to say, I know what you're going through because you don't. So maybe it's, not your, maybe it's not time for your story in that person's life. Or maybe there's somebody else at work and say, what's going on? You say, I don't know, man. I'm just in that place where, to be honest with you, I just feel so lonely. I just feel completely cut off. You know, I'm here without family and I'm trying to learn this new job. And all of a sudden you remember when you went to basic training, you were 18 years old and you were cut off from family. And you felt like everyone at basic training knew everybody else but, but you. And you're the only one. And yet God helped you in that moment. And you, you went deeper with him. And that's when your devotional life really began to bloom. And so you feel that nudging. That, that person's life is asking questions that your story can answer. So you respond with, you know, I've been in that place. I know what you're talking about. And then you describe how that feels. And they go, that's exactly how I'm feeling right now. Yeah, but when I was at basic, God really helped me. Excuse me, you said God helped you? I mean, do you believe in God? Yeah, I really do. Because he's real to me. I mean, he changed my life in this area. And how many of you know that you can't argue with the miracle of a changed life, right? So that's why our stories are so powerful. And so the, the truth is, sometimes in sharing the good news, there's also some bad news. Have you noticed that? Kind of go together. Like the good news the young man got, he wanted to jump out of an airplane and finally he finished his qualifications. We got the good news that he could jump. And so he got up in the plane and the good news, so he jumps out of the back of the plane feeling about good news, but then when he pulled the parachute, it didn't open. There's the bad news. So the good news was he looked down and said, oh look, I'm headed right for a haystack. The bad news was there was a pitchfork in the haystack. The good news was he missed the pitchfork. The bad news was he missed the haystack. So there's good news and there's bad news, and that's kind of really bad news. There's good news and there's bad news. But, but here's, here's the good news for you. Because you know I'm holding this card in my hand, and you know there's one bit your seat, and you know we're getting ready to go through it, and you know I'm going to ask you to use this. And you're thinking, you're scaring me again. Well, here's the good news. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, basically the paid people, 
They have a job. And their job is not to do the work of the ministry. In fact, verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 4 says the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher are supposed to equip the saints, coach the saints, empower the saints, train the saints, release the saints so that the saints, the people of God, can do the work of the ministry so the body of Christ is built up. So we actually move forward. So more people come to Christ. So we can go from add to multiply. Hello? If all the ads add, we can go from add to multiply. We can experience revival. But at some point, somebody's going to have to say something. We talked about that last week. That we, we, we got our story, and once we share our story, what's next? Now that we've identified, now that we say we know God, now that you say I am a God story, what do you do next? So we're going to take a look at this little card, and I'm going to walk you through how to do this. And it is so, so very simple. But first, there's one verse I want to look at that's really important that I think sometimes we get confused on especially in our society. So Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse six, he said, I am the way. There aren't two ways. There's only one way. There's only one way to be right with God and that's through his son, Jesus Christ. There aren't other paths. As much as people out there wanna teach you that all roads lead to God, they don't. Only one road leads to God. Either that or Jesus was lying and he's God, which means if God lies, he's no longer God. So we're kind of, we either have to say, I'm a Christian and I believe what Jesus said, or I'm not a Christian, and if I believe what Jesus said and I am a Christian, there's only one way. Can we say one way? One way. All right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, not like there are alternate truths. Not like, well, this is true for you, but I have a different truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and watch this. No one comes to the Father but by me. So no matter what we do, no matter where we go, if we're going to be right with God, it's going to pass through the channel of one person. He's the door. His name is Jesus Christ. Are we good with that? All right. So pick up the little card that you see on your seat and take a look at it. And I'm going to walk you through this. This is so simple. Look at the side that says the Romans road. And the reason it's called the Romans road is you'll see there are five verses taken right out of the book of Romans. And there's the gospel right there. My oldest son, Christopher, says this is his favorite of all the different models for leading someone to Christ. So there you are. You shared your story. And they say, well, what about this, this relationship with God that you have? Can I have that relationship? And they may not ask that question that way, but it'll be obvious that there's the nudge and it's time to share. So you can break out this card. You say, hold a minute, Michael. Do you want me to keep this card with me everywhere I go? Yes, when you go to the beach and get in the pool, or get in the pool, I want you to put it in a plastic bag and duct tape it to your chest. No, I don't want you to take this card with you everywhere you go. Some of these are so short and so easy, you can literally memorize it in 15 minutes. But maybe, maybe you're afraid that if you memorize it and you get in the pressure of the moment, you might forget something. So I suggest on your way out, or if you're watching online, you download several copies and you put one in the office, you put one in your glove compartment, and you put one at work or, or at home. So you're talking to your friend and they say, well, I'd like to get to know that Jesus. I mean, how, do, how did you, what, what do you mean you have a relationship with God? What does that look like? Tell you what, let's swing by the office on the way home or let's go to drop by my house. Or if you'll just hold on a minute while we're playing soccer at the break, I'll run to my car and get something out. And when you come out and you say, wait, you want me to show them? Isn't that kind of hokey to say, here's a card? Well, listen, when you buy a house, when you rent a car, right? When you buy appliances, or furniture, the, the salesman, they, they break out the brochure and they lay it out there and they turn it facing you so you can see all the stuff that you're getting into. So you tell a person, I got this card. If, if anybody balks, you say, well, I got this card because this is the greatest news you're ever gonna hear. This is the most important news you're ever gonna receive and I wanna make sure to get it right. I'm not a trained pastor. I'm just a guy, I'm just a gal, just like you. I just wanna get it right. So some people, they have a little New Testament they keep with them, and they just circle these, these verses in Romans. So here's how it goes. I'm talking to a guy. Let's say his name is Mark. And I say, okay, Mark, here it is. The first, we begin with bad news. Here's the bad news. Romans chapter two, 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mark, that means all of us. That means you've sinned, I've sinned. I'm not saying you're worse than me or I'm worse than you. I'm just saying we're all in the same boat. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it gets worse. The news is worse. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. So here's the thing. You've sinned, I've sinned, we've all sinned, and sadly, we all, we all have to pay for our sins. But fortunately, there's good news. So we've all sinned, 
And the wages of sin is death, but it says in the second part of that verse, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God wants to give you eternal life with him as a free gift. And you're probably asking yourself, Mark, how did that happen? How does that come about? We'll look in Romans chapter five, verse eight. For God shows his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mark, Jesus knew that you were a sinner when he was on that cross dying for you. He knew that I was a sinner when he was on that cross dying for me. And the news gets even better. Romans chapter 10, verse nine. Mark, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the power of sin and saved from the consequences of sin. Let me go over this one more time, Mark. You've sinned, I've sinned, we've all sinned. And the really bad news is we gotta pay for those sins. But God loved us so much, he sent his son Jesus Christ to take our place on that cross where he paid for our sins. And all you need to do is confess with your mouth and believe with your heart deep down that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and you'll be saved from your sins and the consequences of those sins. The last verse, Mark, is this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you don't have to call on the name of the Lord like raising up your voice and shouting like you do at a football game, but you can call on him quietly right here, right now on the soccer field with me. Mark, tell me, are you ready to ask Jesus Christ to take over your life and cleanse you from every sin so you can have a relationship with God, not just now, but forever? See how easy that was? Got the card. Did you feel weird when I'm looking at the card? Neither will Mark. He'll be impressed you have one. When it's over, he'll say, and he gives, gives his life to Christ, he'll say, where do I get a card like that? you say, fool, you should have joined church early. You only did one series. You're out. <laughs> the next one, keep, keep the card on the same side. This next one was actually adapted from the Four Spiritual Laws, which was written by Bill Bright and used by the Billy Graham Association. That is the track that I got saved with, what we're about to look at. And, and let me just say, these, little, these three little diagrams on here, this is, to me, the easiest one. Because all you have to remember are these three little diagrams. I don't know the number of times I sat on an airplane or at a restaurant or someplace and just got out a pen and a piece of paper or a napkin and drawn these three diagrams. It's so simple. Let's just take a look at the top. So you say, Mark, God loves you. It used to say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but it's been modified. So Mark, God loves you and created you to know him. God made you to be in relationship with him. Did you, did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Some of our yearnings and our desires and our passions can only be satisfied in God because God made us for him. So it says here, God loves you and created you to know him. John, Mark, this is, not John Mark. Mark, this is the, mo this is the most famous verse in the whole Bible. You've seen this at basketball games, football games, baseball games. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then it says in John 17, three, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So God wants to know you. God wants you to experience the purpose for which he made you. God wants you to experience his love. But here's the bad news, Mark. Look at B. Man is sinful. When I say man is sinful, let's be honest. You're sinful, I'm sinful. We're both sinful. If we're gonna be honest, we're far from perfect. So man is sinful and separated from God. He cannot know him personally and experience his love. That's a tragedy. Look what the Bible says, Romans 3, 23. And by the way, you're gonna notice these same verses keep coming up over and over again. So you get one of these, it's, it's like learning a language. Once you learn one language, the second one comes, more, comes much more easily. I can't even speak English, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you notice these verses come up again and again. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, there's the problem. Mark, we've all sinned. I already, I already mentioned that. You and me both. And here it's, it's even worse. For it says the wages of sin is death and the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That's why I take a look at this diagram. Diagram one goes with B, okay? Mark, take a look at this diagram. Man is on one side, God is on the other, and there's this chasm in between. We can't get across. Oh, we try to get across, but we can't get across it. Number, point number C, because Jesus Christ is the only provision for our sin. It's only through him that we can know God personally and experience his love. Look, Mark, in John chapter five, verse eight, God shows his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinning against God and he knew we were and yet he loved us enough to die in our place. And then in 1 Timothy chapter one, verse 15, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's the good news, Mark. That means you and I qualify because we've both sinned against God. So 
Right now, you may be outside of a relationship with God, but in the next five minutes, you can be inside of a relationship with God because Jesus came to save you from your sins, just like he did me. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. By the way, diagram two goes with point number C, okay? So Jesus is the only way, but we try all kinds of ways to get right with God. So we think sometimes through philosophy, we can work our way back toward God. Look at the diagram. It doesn't work. Or maybe our good works. Some of us think, Mark, actually I thought that if I could be good enough and have enough good works, God would weigh my good works against my bad works. And if my good works outweighed my sins, he'd let me in. But this doesn't work. Matter of fact, tell you the truth, when I was given that track that night, this was the diagram that did me in. This, This part right here, B, diagram two. It's what did me in. As I said, Religion's not going to get me there either. Mark, all kinds of religions around the world. They're not going to get you there. There's only one person that can get you. Only one person can bridge that giant chasm between man and God. Look at point number D, and that's Jesus Christ. We must individually receive Jesus Christ. See, Mark, I received Jesus Christ X number of years ago, and now it's your turn. Jesus paid for all my sins, just like Jesus paid for your sins And now it's your turn. We must individually receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in order to know God personally. And I know your heart's asking, how do I get to know God? And this is how. You have to individually receive him. For in fact, Jesus said it in John chapter 1 verse 12. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. You want to be in the family of God? You want to know God personally? You want all of your sins forgiven? All you need to do is receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It says here, for by grace we've been saved through faith. And that not of my own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no man may boast. Look at that final diagram there, Mark. It's only through Jesus. He's the way. Are you ready right now to receive Jesus into your life and ask him to forgive you of all your sins you may be, that you can be made right with God and have a personal relationship with him? See how easy that was? That took less than five minutes. How easy that was. So turn the card over. Are you all with me? Jump. The water's fine. So turn the card over and hold it where it says evangelism explosion. And I'm going to do my wife a huge favor right now. I'm going to invite my youngest son, Samuel, to come up on the stage. And I'm going to lead Samuel to Christ right now. So he, he's on our staff, but there's not a question. You can step a little bit closer to the middle. I won't bite you. And if I do, I've had my rabies shot. You're forgiven. Yeah. There's not a question on our application. Do you actually know Jesus? And we know, I'm just kidding. You know he's born again, right? Just in case he went, I can't believe Sam got saved in church tonight. Well, it happened when he was like four. But anyway, we'll pretend he's not. All right, so evangelism explosion. This is a great, and, and you're going to want to turn it so you can see these questions. And I'm going to interrupt myself every now and I'm going to say freeze. And you all pretend like we just froze a conversation, and I'm going to give a little commentary. Is that all right? You all with me? Can you see how easy this is? This is so in reach. This is so within your reach. You are so beyond. You're so capable. You've got so much Bible knowledge. You've got a great relationship with God. This is really just like jumping off that. Just got to take the jump. Just go out there, close your eyes, jump, and don't land on dad. All right. So I'm in a conversation with this young man. And so I'm going to ask what's called two diagnostic questions to find out where he is, all right? So the first one is this. Sam, have you come to the place in your life where you know for certain that if you die tonight, you'd go to heaven? Uh, I guess so. Okay. I think. All right. Well, let me ask you a second question. Suppose you were to die tonight. I hope you don't, but suppose you were to die tonight and you were to stand before God and he said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I would probably say I'm a good person. I've done good works. And uh, I've just tried to live a moral life. Okay, so let me see if I understand what you'd say. You'd say that you've obeyed the commandments, that you try to be a good person, you're a pretty moral person, sometimes not, but mostly, mo- mostly moral. Is that your answer? Yes. Okay, freeze. Is that a good answer? How many believe that's a terrible answer? If you didn't raise your hand, okay, good. Even he raises that. That's a terrible answer. So now I'm stuck, right? Now I've painted myself into a corner. Now I've got a guy standing here, and I've got to tell him it's a stupid answer. So here's how you do it. That is a very stupid answer. No, you don't do that. Thank you. You don't do that. So pretend. Now here's how you tell somebody their answer is a bad answer. 
So pretend that you're at, at the reading of the will of your grandfather. And it's been rumored to you that you're going to receive $10,000 in the inheritance, okay? Would that be all right? Anybody use an extra 10? Yeah. So you'd be happy. You're sad for grandpa, but he's in heaven, so you're glad to take his 10. Okay? So you're thinking that, and so you interrupt the lawyer, and you say, excuse me, but aren't I getting $10,000? He says, no, you're not. You're getting $100,000. Is, is that okay? Would you trade 10 for 100? Okay, watch this. Unfreeze. So basically you'd say you're a good person and you, you try to be moral, sometimes not, but mostly moral. You kind of stay in the middle of the road and try to do your best. Right, right. You know, when we first started talking, Sam, I thought I might have some good news to share with you. But now that I've heard your answers to these questions, I know I've got the best news you've ever heard. Heaven is a free gift. Jesus gives you eternal life as a free gift. See what I just did? Oh, turn your card where it says gospel presentation. I just jumped in the first point. Turn it this way now, okay? Take a look at it. Heaven's a free gift, and it can't be earned or deserved. In fact, the Bible says, Romans chapter 6, have we heard that verse before? Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, see, heaven's a free gift, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the bad news, though, and there is some bad news here. Man is a sinner, and he can't save himself. When I say man, I mean, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. You've sinned. Would you admit that? Yes. Yeah, me too. I've sinned too. And the problem is we can't fix it. We can't save ourselves. Look what it says here. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned, that's you and me, and fall short of the glory of God. And it says, for, the, for by grace you're saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. We can't fix this. It's a gift of God, not the result of works. Again, we can't fix this so that no one can boast. But there's some good news. God is merciful, and he doesn't want to punish us. In fact, it says in the Bible, look right here, 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. That's the good news. But again, there's some bad news. The same Bible that says that God is love also says that God is just and he must punish sin. You've sinned, right? Yes. And me too. That means we're going to face punishment. Let me just show it to you in the Bible. It says here in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 4, it says the soul that sins shall die. It doesn't mean the soul that sins like 100 million times. It means the soul that sins even one time. And you've already said that you try to mostly stay moral, but not always, but mostly. And you try to mostly do what's good, but not always, but mostly. And you've admitted that you're a sinner. So that means the soul who sins shall die. And then it says in Jeremiah 31, verse, verse 30, everyone shall die for his own sin. So look at this crowd of people. I mean, all these people are sinners. That means they're all got to pay unless we can find somebody else to pay. And that is the good news, the best news of all. Jesus Christ paid for our sins and purchased a place in heaven for us, which he offers as a free gift. So Jesus Christ did it all. All the stuff you're trying to do, Jesus did it for you. Look, it says right here, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. We got that part. We got to pay. But, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, pause, freeze. If I'm sitting at a desk or someplace where there's a book, I want to get the biggest book I can get. And if I can't get a book, then I'm just going to use my wallet, all right? So I'm going to say to this, all right, Sam, where are you going? Come on over here. Oh, I'm sorry. So Sam, pretend this is me. And I know this is a wallet, but pretend this is a book. And inside this book is a record of all my sins. Let's call this the record book of sins. Every single time I lied or exaggerated or was late or was unkind to somebody, you know those are all sins, right? Every time I was angry or lustful or proud or, do you see what I'm talking about? There's a right. lot of them. Right. So I got to pay for all these sins. This is Jesus. Notice there's no record book in his hand. Why? Because Jesus is perfect. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray and everyone's turned to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now where's the record book of your sins? In Jesus' hands. And what about you? I'm free. See what I just did? That's a verse. I just go back to the card, okay? So go back where it says, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone's turned to his own. You just have to remember. Isn't that a cool illustration? Hello, just five people. Isn't that a cool illustration? <laughs> so here I am. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone's turned to his own way. This is Jesus. Now he's perfect. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's got your sins, now you don't. See, that totally kills the whole works thing and all that. It makes Jesus the centerpiece of salvation. 
Such a beautiful illustration. And all you have to do is memorize that one verse. But it kind of goes with the hand motions. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone's turned to his own way. But the Lord laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. So here's the thing. Here's the beauty of it all. It kind of sums up in this one point. That free gift is received by faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. You can't earn your way there. It's a gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one can boast. Does this make sense to you? Yes. Okay, now look what I did. Look down here. I jumped down to the commitment portion. See that? I, just, I, could, I didn't have to just, I could have gone back to look, but I just jumped to it, all right? Does this make sense to you? Yeah. All right. Would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Let's do it. Let's do it. I don't think you're sincere. I want you to go straight to hell. Forgive me. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's what happens when you get a born-again kid to play the lost kid. Let's start over. Does this make sense to you? Yes, it does. Would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay, let me clarify for this is very, very important. First of all, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died for your sins, was raised from the dead. Secondly, you repent of your sins. There's sorrow. There's grief that you've sinned against God. And you repent of your sins, and then you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Is that what you like to do? Yes. And you're certain of that? Yes. Let's pray right now. Say, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. That you died. That you died. On the cross. On the cross. For my sins. For my sins. I've sinned. I've sinned. I admit it. I admit it. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Come into my life. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. Make me right with God. Make me right with God. From this moment forward. From this moment forward. You're my Lord. You're my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. I'm going to follow you forever. I'm going to follow you forever. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to Sam for getting born again. See how easy that is. Now, now I just want to tell you a quick story, and, and then I'll close in prayer. A couple of weeks ago, I was in England, and I was in a taxi cab, and I was going to Heathrow Airport. And at first, you know, I'm looking through my documents, making sure everything's together. And then you just, how are you? And the, 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 the cabbie, how are you? Where are you from? The United States. Oh, really? I've got family in the United States. Where are you? North Carolina. Oh, my family's in New York. So he begins to tell me that he's had an experience of death in his family. His uncle died. He's got, he said, you've got to understand, we're a very close family. Very, very close. I mean, family's everything to us. We're, we're Muslim, so family's really important, really, really tight. And uh, we're from, where are you from? Well, well, we're from Kashmir. Well, Kashmir is kind of a disputed area between Pakistan and India. It's a really rough place. We have some family there, but it's a family in New York. That's where the uncle was when he died. And, and you know, I got my grandmother and my mother. And so that means, the, and then what happened when, the, when my uncle died, his father, my grandfather died. We're really suffering right now. I mean, this is really grieving us and it's really, really terrible. And I, and I could just see this is, this is being set up, right? So easy. So we got into the conversation and come to find out he's not even a really good Muslim. Um, and, and the only reason I say that is because he didn't know some things. And, and I said, well, actually, I studied Islam in Bible college. He said, well, you probably know more than me. And so, well, actually, you believe this. He said, oh, I didn't know. I thought we believed that. So it was, it's like, okay, this is, this is playing right into my, I went to Bible college for this. I understand Islam better than he does. He's talking about death. So then I said, well, what's your hope of making it into eternal life? Well, my hope, because his grandfather's uncle are not my concern. They're, they're gone. But he's the one in front of me. So I said, what, what's your hope? And he said, well, you just, I just have to work harder and get better. And I said, let me ask you a question. How, how, how good is good? I mean, when do you know when you've made it? And then he said, well, they teach in Islam, and they don't, by the way. They teach in Islam that your last 30 days before you die, you know you're going to die. And so you've got 30 days to work really, really hard to get everything right in order to go to heaven when you die. And I said, yeah, but in Christianity, Jesus Christ dies on the cross and covers all your sins. So he does all the work for you. He said, yeah, but I had an uncle that was really, really terrible. And everyone knew he's a terrible, he's a wicked man. But the last 30 days, he did so many good things. And then at his funeral, people talked about how good he was. And I thought, you aren't even listening to what I'm saying. And we arrive at Heathrow Airport. And I got out of the car. And I just said to my heart before God, Lord, I missed a layup. I mean, that, that's a layup. It all just was right there. Death, hope for eternal life through work, showed him it wasn't going to work. That 30 days thing was crazy. Talked about Jesus 
And there he goes. So I prayed as I walked away. And then it dawned on me, Michael, today was a seed sowing day. It doesn't always have to end with a slam dunk, even if it looks like one. All we need to do is be faithful to obey the nudge and step out there and share the word and leave the results to Jesus. Can we do that? All we got to do is just close our eyes, take a deep breath, and jump. The water's fine. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you that the gospel was not made for PhDs, but it was made so two little kids on the street could get together, and the one little kid could share with the other little kid the simple message And the other little kid could trust Jesus Christ and go to heaven when he dies. Thank you that your word even tells us it's out of the mouth of babes that your purposes will be declared. Thank you, Lord, for giving us such a simple message. Give us the confidence and the courage to take a shot. Maybe even around the Thanksgiving table. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your head bowed for just one more moment, if you will. Maybe you're here and you're, it dawned on you that it, but maybe for the first time it all kind of came together. And you said, you know, when you, when you presented it like that, it, it really made sense in a way it hasn't before. And now I'm beginning to wonder, was I right with God before or is this my moment? And if you're here right now and you're not certain where you stand with him, this is it. This is your moment. This is your moment. Make no mistake about it. You could have been a lot of places, but you're here in this service. This is your moment. So what do I do with it, Michael? Well, just a moment, I and the host at the other sites are going to pray a prayer. 30 seconds, we're going to pray a prayer. For everyone who wants to make sure that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and wants to really make certain that they're in the family. And if that's you and you say, Michael, would you include me in that prayer? I won't embarrass you. Our site host won't embarrass you. We're just going to pray with you. We're just going to, you raise your hand, we're going to include you in that prayer. So if that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're saying, include me in that prayer. Side host, Michael, please include me in that prayer. So I can know for certain when I leave here today that I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. If that's you, you want to be included in that prayer, just slip your hand up right where you are. I'll see your hand. Yeah, right over here. I won't embarrass you. Right over here too. Great. Excellent, right over here. Thank you. Anybody else? Just slip your hand up. Would you hold it up long enough for our host team to make their way to you? They're going to put a gift in your hand. It's a CD. It's six minutes long. Please listen to it in your car on the way home. And, and it's got five key elements in it about your relationship with God and what your next step is. Also attached to that CD is a little white card. Just take it out and take it off and fill it out and leave it on your seat. And our host team will pick it up later and we'll contact you down the road to see if we if we can serve you in any way, if you need a Bible or have any prayer requests. Anybody else who's already, besides those who've already raised their hand, want to get in on this prayer, just lift your hand up high and I'll see it. We'll include you as well. Anybody else? Awesome. Everybody out loud. You ready? Say, Jesus, thank you for that cross, that simple cross where you died for sinners just like me. I admit that I've sinned against you Please forgive me, cleanse me, come into, your lo- come into my life, be my Savior, be the Lord of my life. From this moment forward, I'm yours both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a hand to those who raise their hands.